Some universes and continents in Fire Emblem straight up suck. Magvel is corrupt with monsters, then Grotto just has an earthquake and destroys the country. Valentia is literally rotting at the core. Existing in Thracia just sucks for anyone, but especially kids. In today's video, we're going to examine three doomsday scenarios. Mystery of the Emblem slash New Mysteries bad ending, Grima's first assault on Old Arcanea, and the Schism, and the Scouring and the Ending Winter. This video will serve mostly as an exploration of these historical events in the series, so very dedicated Fire Emblem fans may already be 100% knowledgeable on the topic already. But still, maybe you'll learn something new, just like I did. Arcanea's Bad Ending In Mystery of the Emblem, Garnif returns. His soul didn't die, so welcome back, Garnif. Still driven to destroy the world, he comes up with a plan to revive Medeus once again this time through the sacrifice of four noble-born maidens. Also, this lad came up with some clever machinations to give himself insurance that the heroes wouldn't cheat and use the starlight to kill him again by stealing the starlight. Basically, Garnef does his very best to not get killed this time. The Fire Emblem is another X factor relating to defeating Garnef. First, it can weaken Earth Dragons and reseal them. Second, the Fire Emblem can repel and reveal evil when it is fully restored with all the gems. In order to get the true and good ending of Fire Emblem 3 and Fire Emblem 12, Marth must restore the shield. When this occurs, Garnif's disguise as a maiden in the penultimate chapter is revealed, and then Starlight, which is obtained from Michaelis, because Michaelis took it from Garnif and then dies from his injuries slash survives, depending on what game you're playing, can kill him for good. Without the shield restored, Garnif successfully tricks the heroes and the game would just end there. With the restored shield, however, Garnif is exposed and killed with Starlight for good, and you move on to fighting Medeus with the shield and killing him too. The consequences behind actually getting tricked by Garnif and not killing him or Medeus are pretty grim, because Medeus actually does get revived. Fire Emblem 3 doesn't address these implications and pretends everything is hunky-dory. Fire Emblem 12 does though. They elaborate on Marth's failure to defeat Garnif in Marth and Chris's ending. Not much is written about Chris in the pages of history. However, there are whispers of a knight who gave their life to save Marth or whom served him to the bitter end. Marth ascended as the fifth king of Altia. He worked tirelessly to reconstruct the ruined land, but soon had to fight another war against the revived Shadow Dragon. This other war, and Chris's death, is the ending playing out. Now, the FE12 ending stops there. We are left to assume, at worst, Marth eventually won this third war, but Chris died. But actually, in a crazy twist, this bad ending is the timeline where you get, and I'm not kidding, Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp FE. In a really, really detailed plot post by Reddit user GameBooColor, they explain how Arcanea's bad ending and TMS's world are linked. たたかうための姿に変わっていったの。そういう世界だったから、みんなで力を合わせればガーネフをきっと止められるって。たくさんの人がね、ガーネフを止めようとしてたんだよ。ガーネフは止められたのか。たくさんの本当にたくさんの人
But the TMS timeline expands on this and says that Tiki was sent by Naga to the Idolus Sphere, which is the connection between Arcanea and the modern world. By following TMS's timeline, the bad ending was actually much worse than assumed. Marth straight up failed to kill Medeus and the original Arcanea was completely destroyed. The thread goes into greater detail about the connection, but the point is, following the alternate bad ending and TMS, Arcanea was kaputz and Marth died for real. It's a spin-off title, and of course the canon FE12 ending is obviously they win by entirely unraveling Garnef and killing Medeas, eventually leading to awakening a millennia or two later. But still, it's a pretty wild connection. Grima and the Schism Continuing with Arcanea, the Schism is a vaguely described world-slash-society-changing event having to do with Grima, the Fire Emblem, and the First Exalt. It bridges the gap between Marth's Arcanea and Krom's Elise. Thanks to the added Act 6 of Fire Emblem Echoes, Shadows of Valentia, we learned that Grima, then known as simply the Creation, was a man-made being by the alchemist Forneus from a mixture of many ingredients, including divine dragon blood. The creation grew both in size and in intellect, and eventually, both beings could peer into each other's souls. Forneus then started to sense dark and violent thoughts from the creature and sought to kill it, but he failed and was killed instead. This began to fuel a hatred of humanity for the creation. The creation was already quite large by the time Alm and Selica came across it in Thebes, but peak Grima is utterly, mind-blowingly huge. Like, look how big this thing is. As a disclaimer for the next section, this is my interpretation of the events leading to the schism. This Grima, fueled with rage, leaves Thebes and completely levels Northern Arcania. The first Exalt, then just a descendant of Marth, has no choice but to retreat to Arcanea. While things could have changed, Altea has always been a small kingdom despite its legacy, and Arcanea has always been the Empire superpower. The kingdoms of southwestern Arcanea would likely have had to make a strategic retreat to the Empire to have the best chance at surviving Grima. Another possibility is that the Exalt fought Grima in Altea too. Grima's skull is where Dolor used to be and where Plagia is now. There, the pact between Naga and the Altian descendant is made, with Falchion and the Fire Emblem to grant him the strength to defeat Grima. As established with all pacts, they all have stipulations. The stipulation with this pact is that Grima cannot be killed, but only laid to rest for a thousand years, and the descendant will be given a brand, and when the time comes, the branded exalt will be the one to wield Falchion to put him to sleep once again. The pact works, and Grima is finally defeated but Arcanea, as they knew it, is completely leveled. Grima's size and power literally terraformed the continent, as seen with the geological differences between Arcanea and Elise. The first Exalt, being the victor over Grima, would found the Halidom of Elise, where the Empire of Arcanea and Talus are located. This is sort of where things get a little hazy. If the Exalt defeated Grima on the western side of the continent, then it makes more sense that Grima's skull would have landed in Plagia, but then why would Arcanea and Talus be ruled by an Altian as a result? Altia being leveled and them going to Arcanea as a retreat seems more plausible, but Grima's skull being much further west than where Arcanea is makes the scenario less believable. Honestly, who knows? Maybe they retreated, then went back to western Arcanea after the pack was established and killed Grima there. Or maybe Grima was killed in Arcanea and Grima just crash landed by trying to escape and turning west. In any case, something like this must have happened. Being the first country of the new world, the continent would be renamed to this as well. With millions dead and the world changed forever, new countries would have to reform. This is where I believe this schism finally occurs. The gemstones would be scattered throughout Elise. Different nations would occupy different stones. Elise would have Sable, Ferox would have Ghouls, Tiki kept Azur with her, the Chanzin would keep Vert, and Plagia would steal Sable. Plagians, of course, founded Plagia, and their castle would be built around Grima's skull. The parallels between Dolor and Arcanea, and Plagia and Elise, are really interesting if you're familiar with Arcanea's lore. Ferox would be established where northern Arcania used to be, and Chanzin would be founded presumably where Valentia used to be. What's funny is that the schism is essentially a throwaway line meant to describe what happens shortly after Grima's first defeat. In my opinion, what's more interesting is how the schism even happened. There is no being in Fire Emblem that even comes close to Grima's power. He's so strong that the pact made between the first Exalt wasn't even designed to fully kill him, but to just put him asleep for a thousand years. While the time between FE3 and Awakening is a long time, I suppose, 
there is no way this much geological change can occur within that time frame naturally. Grima's power is truly insane. The Scouring and the Ending Winter The Scouring was a massive war that broke out between humans and dragons on the continent of Alib 1,000 years before the events of Fire Emblem The Binding Blade. The reasons for the war has been lost to time, but nevertheless, it was a destructive war that saw severe casualties for both sides. Where the dragons had destructive power, humanity had its own ability, reproduction. Indeed, the dragons started to lose the war because they not only were outnumbered, but the reproductive rate of humans was too fast for them to keep up. Dragons had the strength, but humans had the numbers, giving humans the edge in the war. So the dragons came up with a plan. Bargain with the divine dragons so they can turn one of them into a demon dragon, a dragon that could create war dragons to bolster their forces. But the divine dragons, staying neutral in the conflict, decided to peace out. Sadly, one of the divine dragons was left behind, Idun. The dragons took her and destroyed her soul, turning her into a demon dragon, causing her to become a drone programmed to produce war dragons. This shifted favor back into that of the dragons, as now they could keep up with the human reproduction rate. Desperate and backed in a corner, the humans combined brain and brawn, and created the eight legendary weapons specifically designed to penetrate the scales of dragons. Durandal, Armads, Orblaze, Oriola, Mulagir, Maltet, Apocalypse, and Exax. But the combined power between the legendary weapons and the power of the dragons was too much that the laws of physics and nature were literally distorted, and nature's recourse to get back on track was the Ending Winter. The Ending Winter sapped so much magical energy out of the world that it greatly nerfed the weapons, but also severely weakening the dragons. The dragons, unable to maintain their form because of this distortion, were forced to take human form and to place their power into dragon stones. And the humans took full advantage and killed as many dragons as they could. I didn't really take into account how long the scouring would have been, but because of humankind's ability to reproduce became an advantage, this war must have gone on long enough for the human's force to replenish its forces from babies being born during wartime. Not exactly the funnest time to be alive, all things considered. But what about the ending winter? What exactly is said about this event? Unfortunately, like the schism, there is only a handful of text boxes. I learned that in the ending winter, the laws of nature were all warped. Day became night, and summer became winter. The scrolls I read on the topic are so time-worn that I couldn't decipher all of them. But one thing is clear. The ending winter was a disaster powerful enough to bend and twist the whole planet. Yon, the surviving fire dragon, echoes this too. The laws of nature started to collapse. Snow began to fall in midsummer. Stars shone in the middle of the day. Let's break this down. What does that actually mean? This honestly sounds like some fantastical version of a nuclear winter. The hypothetical nuclear winter, being when chemicals, debris, ash, and soot from nuclear explosions rise into the stratosphere and block out the sun. The impact and raw magical energy firing out from the legendary weapons clashing against the dragons rising to the sky and causing bizarre weather phenomena could occur, I guess. I mean, it's magic, so who really knows what the rules are? Mime says the ending winter was a disaster powerful enough to bend and twist the whole planet. Keyword being whole. The scouring took place on Elib's continent, not the whole world. If there was some sort of nuclear winter scenario, it would be localized to that stratosphere and above. The following that I'm about to say sounds a little crazy, and I don't really care, because this is all conjecture at the end of the day. But if the entire planet was impacted, and the laws of nature are said to have reversed insofar that summer became winter and day became night, I think the planet's rotation actually literally shifted. If the planet's alignment shifted 180 degrees north to south and a further 180 degrees east to west, this would switch the northern and southern hemispheres with one another. This reversal would set the planet backwards or forwards by 12 hours thus causing night and day to switch. The old northern hemisphere would have winter when it's supposed to have summer, and the southern hemisphere would have vice versa. When Nime says that the planet was bent and twisted, that could be what she meant. This rotation shift couldn't be permanent though, otherwise it would happen all the time. And it wasn't. Eventually, the ending winter stopped and everything went back to normal. Although, given that dragons continue to use dragonstones, it is likely that the ending winter's magic draining effects lingered on.
Could the kinetic force of legendary magical weapons with the might of dragons have shaken the planet so hard that its orientation was shifted for a time? Who knows? We unfortunately can't really infer that much else from this event. The scouring ended 1,000 years before Binding Blade, and there's nothing else relating to the aftermath of it. We will never know why the scouring started to begin with. Maybe it was humanity's nature of conquest, maybe their greed, maybe it was a disagreement, who knows. But it happened, and it devastated the continent. Weapons created to combat dragons caused the laws of nature to get super backwards as the planet literally lost its orientation and the presence of magic in the world was permanently significantly lost. Well, doomers, I hope you enjoyed this video. Coming into the script, I only knew the bad ending of Mystery of the Emblem, but the connection to TMS was very, very fascinating. I knew next to nothing about the schism and the formation of Elise, and while that's mostly my conjecture, which is subject to being wrong, which I'd fully admit to, I'm actually quite impressed with how Awakening decided to hit the hard reset button on Arcanea like that. Finally, I always assumed that the ending winter was kind of a throwaway line, much like the schism was, but I had a ton of fun actually exploring what the ending winter actually was supposed to be. That's all for today's video, and I sincerely hope you enjoyed it. If you did, and you're still here, please leave a like and comment down below your thoughts. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing so. I'm halfway to 82k subscribers, and I really like to get there. That being said, hope you have a good weekend. Deuces. Thank you.